Good evening. Hello. Um, thank you all very much for joining us here tonight at the Center for Jewish History. Um, my name is David Brown. I'm the director of public history for the Leo Beck Institute. And um, as your uh, hosts tonight, uh, the Leo Beck Institute is, is very um, happy to welcome you. And I just want to say a few words to acknowledge all the people, um, uh, at least some of the people who helped put tonight's program together. Of course, it, it takes uh, a lot of work from a, a lot of people to do something as ambitious as the program you're about to hear uh, tonight, um, but a few partners and organizations deserve special uh, acknowledgement. So uh, first of all, we want to thank uh, Michael Levitt and the American Society for Jewish Music. Uh, Thank you, uh, Michael, for all your, your work uh, organizing uh, tonight's event and helping us get the word out. Um, also, uh, if you don't know uh, already, you should check your program uh, for information about two more events in this series that will be held um, at the um, very lovely space of one of our other partners, the Austrian Cultural Forum New York. Um, so thank you to the um, ACFNY um, for your uh, support of tonight's evening uh, and, um, uh, and two more concerts coming up. Um, and uh, finally, we'll be hearing from, um, not finally actually, but uh, we will be hearing from Michael Haas of the Exil Arta Center for Band Music uh, based in Vienna, um, another uh, partner for tonight's program. Um, but there is uh, one innovator who um, uh, deserves a very special recognition, um, Michael Lahr of Elysium Between Two Continents, um, along with uh, his partner, uh, Grigory von Leitis, um, uh, really conceived of tonight's program and uh, put an enormous amount of uh, uh, blood, sweat, and tears, and also intellectual power into bringing it all together. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you now Michael Lahr, who will say a few words about um, what we're going to hear tonight. So Michael. <laughs> One more thing before Michael comes up, don't forget to join us outside. Afterwards, we're going to have a reception with uh, wine and snacks. So we look forward to talking to you then. And uh, right now, here comes Michael. Yeah, good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy uh, that finally this program comes to fruition, which has been in the works for many, many years. It has actually been my idea since I first saw this photo that you all have on the cover of the program notes. This photo came to us uh, in the estate of Egon Lustgarten, one of the composers who is pictured on the program and one of the founders of the International Society for Contemporary Music 100 years ago in Salzburg. And uh, since I saw this photo, I had the idea of so doing something with it, maybe reviving this moment in history uh, when they all met in the summer of 1922 in Salzburg and maybe playing some of the music that they had composed and presented for the first time back then. In the center of this photo, you see the only lady in a group of men, Ethel Smythe, uh, a British composer who struggled hard to really uh, gain recognition as a lady composer, as she was called. But actually, her opera, uh, The Wreckers, was done last year in Glyndebourne, and another of her operas uh, was actually one of the very first operas done at the Metropolitan Opera by a female composer. So it would have been interesting to do something like that. But then along the way, when we started, doing more and more research, uh, and Alexis Rodder came on board, we thought maybe it would be more interesting to focus on those composers on this image that later had to flee uh, when the Nazis came to power and found exile here in the United States, or in the case of Egon Welles, who was really instrumental along with Rudolf Reti to uh, create this uh, International Society for Contemporary Music. He fled to England. And this is what you are going to hear tonight. You are mostly going to hear compositions uh, by these composers that were actually written while they were already in exile 
and maybe it shows some of the influences that they were exposed to and that they absorbed while they were living here and had met uh, American composers. You will hear maybe some jazz tunes, some Americana uh, tonality in some of those pieces, as well as the usual late romanticism and uh, moderate modernity. So this is what, what we did, and we went into archives in some cases, uh, in the case of Rudolf Reti, for example, we really had to look very hard. Even the head librarian of the Library of Congress who thought that the pieces would be in their boxes, that who, which are not catalogued yet, uh, went himself down into the storage space and came uh, up very disappointed because he couldn't find them there, and somehow pointed us then to the University of Georgia where Reti's wife actually was teaching music pedagogy, and there we were lucky to not enough to find those pieces. So it, as uh, David said, it took a, took a lot of work to really make this happen, and I'm very grateful to the Leo Beck Institute, to the American Society for Jewish Music, and to the Austrian Cultural Forum and Exil Arte for supporting us in this endeavor. Before I introduce Michael Haas, who is going to speak to us from Vienna in a recorded message, and then Alexis Rodder, I would like to acknowledge a few people in the audience. We have uh, two granddaughters of uh, Wilhelm Gross sitting here. That's Jean and Diane Foreman. So a warm welcome to you. <laughs> And I don't know if Helen Cowder has already arrived. She wanted to come. She's coming from New Haven. She is the granddaughter of Hugo Cowder, whose pieces we are also going to hear. And while I'm already at acknowledging people, I also would like to say uh, welcome to uh, Michael Koval, who is the nephew of Max Kowalski, another composer that we have performed in the past here, uh, though he is not a group of this photo, but a warm welcome to you as well. <laughs> and with that, I would like to give the floor to Michael Haas. Michael Haas studied history and uh, music history and piano. He's actually, he was born in America, but is now a British and Austrian citizen. And uh, he is probably best known as the producer of Decca and other big labels. He worked basically with everyone in uh, classical music over the last few decades, has won many awards for his producing efforts, among them the Grammy for Latin music. And uh, he's maybe best known for the series and Arte de Musik that he started with Decca, where they collected uh, and for the first time recorded uh, compositions by composers who were persecuted and had to flee the Nazi regime. He is also the co-founder of Exil Arte in Vienna, and he's going to talk first, and then afterwards I would like to ask Alexis Rodder to come on stage. Alexis has been uh, with Elysium for many years. She started as a soprano in our summer academy, and uh, back then we did some music of Egon Lustgarten, and she was so intrigued that eventually she approached us and asked whether she could do some research, and actually is soon going to finish her PhD on Egon Lustgarten. And she has been a wonderful collaborator and is the program coordinator of Elysium. Michael will talk more about the founding of the International Society for Contemporary Music. And Alexis is going to talk about what it means uh, or meant to be an exiled composer, what experiences they had and how that shaped or not shaped their work. Thank you very much. And after that, uh, the musicians will come on the stage and I promise you, you are in for a treat. It's really an amazing variety of music that we are going to hear. Thank you. Of the 14 composers posing for the photograph taken upon what would become the first gathering of the future International Society for Contemporary Music, or the ISCM, or in German, the Internationale Gesellschaft für Neue Musik, or the EGNM in Salzburg in the summer of 1922, 
only three would not end up blacklisted by the cultural policies of the Nazi party. They were the two English composers, Arthur Bliss and standing front and centre, Ethel Smythe, along with the Dutch composer Willem Piper. Of the remaining 11 composers who found their works prescribed after 1933, only Paul Hindemith and Anton Webern were not banned for reasons for what the Nazi party referred to as race. Conspicuous by their absence were Arnold Schoenberg and Alban Berg, both of whom would be present the following year. Teacher and pupil would both find themselves on cultural blacklists as unfit to represent the music of Hitler's New Germany. In this tangle of what exactly was understood as German music, again, German music, comes the difficulty of defining the concept of German. What today is shown as Austria on European maps was prior to 1918, merely the German-speaking regions of a far larger country that was known as Greater Austria. Greater Austria was mostly made up of non-German speakers. Indeed, the dominance of non-German speaking Austrians was the reason Bismarck decided to leave Austria out of his plan to unify Europe's German confederation into a German nation state. To have included Austria, Bismarck's united Germany would have ended up with millions of Slavs and Hungarians diluting the purity of his aspiration to create a nation state that was as unifyingly German as the French nation state was French. On this slide, one can see more clearly the linguistic divisions, with today's Austria clearly outlined in the southwest, minus the German speaking regions of Moravia, Bohemia, and Italy, along with other scattered pockets of German speakers. Of the remaining composers in the photo, Karl Alvin, who had lived and worked in Vienna since 1920, actually came from Königsberg, today Kaliningrad, part of Russia. Rudolf Reti was born in Serbia and Hugo Kauda was originally from Czechoslovakia. Karl Weigel, Wilhelm Gross, uh, Paul Amadeus Pisk, Egon Lusgarten, Egon Veles, Anton Webern and Karl Horowitz were all born in Vienna underlining the fact that if in the 19th century Vienna attracted musical genius by the 20th century, it was producing its own. Also born in or latterly gravitating towards Vienna and subsequently performed within the context of the I ICSM, only later to be banned by the Nazis were the composers Hans Eisler, Otto Jokl, Erich Korngold, Ernst Krenig, Gustav Mahler, Karl Rathaus, Arthur Schnabel, Leopold Spinner, Ernst Toch, and Alexander Zemlensky. So what exactly did this vast number of band composers represent musically? To understand this, we need to go back to the name of the society they founded. There's a slight shift in emphasis between the English and German names. In English, it's the Society for Contemporary Music, whereas in German, it's the Society for new music. The founding of the society is also significant, not just because it brought composers from formerly belligerent countries together only four years after what would latterly be known as the First World War, but because it was at the advent of a Schoenbergian revolution. He began teaching his 12-tone technique the following year in 1923. Until then, and since 1908, he had departed from tonality in an attempt to break all the barriers he felt restricted artistic expression. Schoenberg felt diatonic tonality restricted his expressive potential. Dissonant departures from tonality as either atonality or 12-tone would in retrospect come to signify for most of today's public the nature of 20th century music. And yet what was contemporary music in 1922 would in retrospect more accurately suggest a plurality of creative directions that seems hardly credible from today's perspective. Modernism had already started in the previous century with Richard Strauss's orchestral tone poems and Mahler's symphonies, which were in effect tone poems strung together as symphonic movements. Mahler, as the father of Central European modernism, is the reason for his inclusion in subsequent ICSM festivals, despite his death 11 years prior to their first gathering in Salzburg in 1922. So what was new, as in Neue Musik, 
and contemporary as reflected in the English, French, Italian and Spanish names. Unresolved dissonance and wanton atonality emerged during the febrile years leading up to the First World War, but the impending apocalypse of 1914 was over by 1922, and the madness reflected in such works as Stravinsky's Sacre du Printemps from 1913 or Schoenberg's five orchestral pieces from 1909 were expressions of the apocalypse still to come. By 1922, it had come and gone, and Europe was back on the road to recovery, though the recovery in the nations that lost the war was very different from the recovery of other countries. How this was to be expressed artistically with the music that appeared relevant to contemporary times was what drew these disparate composers from previously warring nations together. The variety of new voices and ideas would surprise us today. Far from following Schoenberg and Stravinsky into, to, into departures from tonality, there was neoclassicism that attempted to return music to the purity of form while modernizing music's language. There, was also didactic in, there were also didactic initiatives in order to politically educate a post-war population no longer living as subjects under a king or a kaiser, but as citizens with the agency to determine their own destiny. Others believed the emotional pull of Romanticism and Expressionism had been abused and the only solution was to create something that was initially called post-Expressionist. One could perhaps have called it Expressionalist-ism. But by 1925, the term Neue Sachlichkeit, or in English, New Objectivity, was how it would ultimately be classified. If the 20th century is seen today as a century of dissonance, it has to be understood that dissonance was already used in the late 19th century and in the years up to the First World War. As already stated, it was a symptom reflecting the mental anxiety of the old world. With the end of the war, an attempt to restabilize was required in order to move beyond the angst. Schoenberg decided that rather than return to traditional tonality, as was the case with the neoclassicist and the new objectivist, it would be better to reinvent tonality as a new system altogether. Twelve-tone composition captivated progressives as they truly thought it a system that was compatible with an age of technology and science. Like new objectivity, it did not speak to or exploit the emotional response of listeners. For German-speaking Europeans who lost a war, and imperial governance, it was by necessity new. But here we return to an important difference in translation. In German, the society was one of new music and emphasized these new post-war developments. In English, French, Italian and Spanish, it was contemporary music, meaning music that was contemporaneous, thereby offering a wider platform Eric Wolfgang Korngold, Hugo Kauder, Egon Lusgarten, and frankly, most composers living and working in 1922 were not revolutionary. For them, new meant experimenting with modes or like Bartok characterizing folk music. There were, these were, however, contemporary. Mahler, on the other hand, had been dead for 11 years and was clearly not contemporary, but he was seen as a composer of new music. This perception of Mahler as a modernist was not because of any dissonance in his writing, but because of what was referred to as the realism in his symphonies. His polkas, waltzes, marches, etc. weren't attractive recreations of popular dances along the lines of Chopin with his waltzes, mazurkas and polonaises, but grotesque distortions that shocked and disrupted the listener. He left no room for any sense of complacency. Contemporary music, on the other hand, was by far the more general designation for this new multinational society, though one of its purposes was to allow developments from across the world to be heard and compared. Contemporary, rather than new, music could accommodate composers such as Lusgarten and Kauder, not to mention Korngold, Arnold Bax, Florent Schmidt, Alfred Casella, Paul Ducat. Their music was contemporary and often even new, but it was not disruptive in the manner sought by modernist Austro-German composers. Indeed, the question of disruption as a priority in 1922 was probably very far from everyone's mind. 
When Egon Welles attended the Gustav Mahler Festival in 1920 in Amsterdam, it was the first time belligerent nations had been brought together for a joint musical celebration. He wrote movingly of Dutch generosity towards Austrians and Germans, despite their opposing positions during the recent World War. Having seen the ability of music to create a common roof over disparate people and nations, it was only a tiny step towards a society that would strive to achieve the same goal with the founding of a society for contemporary and or new music two years later. Despite accusations at the time and perceptions over the years, the Society for Contemporary and or New Music was not meant exclusively as a platform for artistic disruptors. Nevertheless, the discrepancy between new and contemporary music in the names of the ISCM or the EGNM can be best understood in the context of Austria and Germany not only losing the war in 1918, but losing their pasts. German and Austrian composers needed to be disruptors in order to make sense of the new order that had been imposed upon them. For them, the society had to become a platform for new music. For the rest of the world, particularly those on the winning side of the conflict, it was a society for contemporary music. For both sides of the war, the society for new and contemporary music was not intended as a platform for conflict carried out and by artistic antagonistic factions, but as a means of artistic reconciliation. It was this fundamental purpose that is too often overlooked by those who would only see the ICSM or the EGNM solely and exclusively as an engine of the new. Thank you very much. Hello. So the influx of Austrian and German emigres during the rise of the Nazi regime undoubtedly permanently changed the cultural landscape of the United States. Composers, conductors, and artists found their place in a new land and began to contribute their artistry and intellectualism just as the United States was to enter a period of economic stability and unprecedented political power. For many composers, such as Eric Korngold and Kurt Weil, their forced emigration turned into financial success as they contributed their talents to Hollywood, Broadway, and other American in musical institutions. The psychological impact of forced emigration aside, they led long and fruitful careers in their new country of residence. So some scholars posit that composers such as Kurt Weil, Eric Korngold, and Arnold Schoenberg found so much success and dominance in the American musical scene that America did not end up developing its own unique cultural voice. Dominated by the European culturalism of emigres, the American musical scene proved a paradise for composers who otherwise faced death and persecution in Nazi Germany. However, there were those that did not find paradise in the United States. There are those emigres that never recovered from the disruptive nature of a forced emigration and the imperative of acclimating to a new language, country, and way of life. America was not without its own issues of anti-Semitism and xenophobia. There were irrational fears that exiles were communists, and anti-communist fervor was at its height by the end of the war. The House Committee on Un-American Activities that had been established in 1938 but was inactive during World War II was revived in 1946 leading to fear among exiles that they would experience the same persecution inflicted upon them by the Nazis. It is also easy to fall into the trap of asking, how did these exiles and emigres assimilate? What did they contribute to the musical oeuvre? And what influences did they glean from America? However, my question is more about how did the trauma of exile affect these composers psychologically and spiritually? Can we see the effects of exile in music and what are the long-term echoes of trauma on an artistic mind? Even in discussing exile, we run into complications. In exile studies, we often see the words emigre, exile, and refugee used interchangeably. An immigrant usually implies a person who is attracted to a new country for its merits, while an emigre suggests a pressure for a person to leave their native land, such as a lack of economic opportunity or political persecution. 
Emigre, in fact, has roots from the French Revolution and was used in reference to royalists who fled France at the start of the revolution in 1789. Its usage was later extended to refugees from the Russian Revolution and now generally refers to emigration due to political strife in one's native country. Technically, an exile is one who has been officially banished from their native country, though it often refers to a state of political exile and is used interchangeably with emigre. The word refugee, on the other hand, originally referred to the Protestant Huguenots of seeking freedom from political persecution in France. Sorry, religious persecution in France. The French word refugee became the English refugee and referred to anyone forced to flee to a place of safety because of religious or political beliefs. Following the events of World War II and the Holocaust, the United Nations held the 1951 Geneva Convention or the 1951 Convention relating to the state status of refugees, where the idea of a refugee was more strongly defined, along with what legal protections, assistance, and social rights refugees should receive from the country to which they fled. So while emigre and exile imply that the person fleeing has found some form of home in their new country, refugee has the connotation of someone still seeking a home. The Palestinian American intellectual Edward Said wrote of the experience of exile. Exile is the unbearable rift forced between a human being and a native place, between the self and its true home. Its essential sadness can never be surmounted. The achievements of exile are permanently undermined by the loss of something left behind forever. So for the purposes of this lecture, I will use the term exiled artist going forward. Because while these composers were indeed refugees and emigres, they were not only as people forced into exile, but their intellectual works and artistic contributions were exiled to America as well, many falling prey to the shadow of obscurity fashioned by time and history. Scholar Pamela M. Potter writes, the prospects for intellectuals were idyllic by contrast to other art forms, as the international academic community had rallied to rescue them, exiles, and constructed impressive financial networks to expedite their flight. So while academics, artists, and intellectuals certainly faced better prospects than most, the ideas that their prospects were idyllic contrast directly with archival records from the Emergency Committee in Aid of Displaced Foreign Scholars. According to these records, there were 6,000 applications for aid and only 335 gifts were granted, only about 5% of all scholarly applications. Of these musicians that you will hear tonight, five out of the seven exiled to America applied for age, uh, aid. Egon Veles, Egon Luska, and Paul Pisk and Rudolf Reiti's applications for aid were all rejected. Karl Weigel alone received a grant from the organization. Another misconception about these musical intellectuals and artists is that because music is not necessarily tied to written and spoken word, musicians spoke the international language of music and were therefore less hampered by linguistic difficulties than artistic exiles. However, even prominent composers were forced to adapt their composition to fit American tastes. European composers were also sometimes viewed with jealousy and suspicion. American-born composers like George Gershwin, Roy Harris, and Aaron Copland were celebrated and funded by the governmental federal music project, while exiled composers were forced to adapt to certain commercial markets, as Kurt Weill did to New York's theater scene and Korngold to Hollywood's film arena. In Los Angeles, local composers even formed the Society of Native American Composers to promote music written by composers exclusively born in America. Outside of adaptation for survival, how did exile as a state of being affect composition? Can we even ask this question? In 1950, journalist Albert Goldberg conducted a widespread interview of exiled composers in the Los Angeles area, hoping to answer that very question. The composers adamantly stated that exile in America had not changed their compositional style. Viennese-born composer, uh, composer in exile, Eric Zeitzel, said, American America can find in my work not her own image mirrored, but she can find their strong medicines against the ills of fate, which I have learned to brew and which she may need one day. Schoenberg agreed that his work had not materially changed. If immigration to America has changed me, I am not aware of it. Maybe I had to work four times harder to work for a living, but I made no concessions to the market. Ernst Krenick said, I cannot agree with the theory that the work of European composers settled in this country for the last 15 or 20 years has noticeably changed from what it used to be while they lived in Europe. Eric Zeisel went on to say that his composition may have been changed, but for the better. 
I find the events of my life and consequent strife caused by my immigration to America had indeed a very deep effect on my work, but one which I feel has brought me to the strongest possible artistic impulses rather than frustrations, to the point that I feel I might never have written my best were it not for the great emotional strife of my uprooting. Composer Eugene Zador gave a simpler explanation for any change or lapse in quality of compositions. We have grown 10 or 15 years older and have not discovered the pills which Wagner took to write his Parsifal. However, the question is less whether America changed these composers and their composition and whether exile and the resulting trauma could have affected their composition. A trauma such as forced emigration due to religious beliefs or personal identity is not only individual, but social, making the trauma far-reaching into the, into the individual's community. This creates a collective trauma that perpetually reinforces the individual trauma. Each composer's personal loss was tied also to the loss of others, losses within their family, community, and country. The sense of, the be of belonging offered to them by their homelands and their collective identity as elite Austro-German musicians was destroyed by the realities of war, persecution, and exile. With the loss of the Heimat, the homeland, the exiled artist loses an essential component not only of their identity, but their sense of safety. How does an exiled composer reconcile their two selves, both past and present? How do they reconcile the composer of the Heimat and the composer in exile? More practically, how does one compose when faced with the strife of economic uncertainty and housing instability? Faced with the prospect of losing his home because of his landlord's desire to rent his apartment for more money, one of the composers you will hear tonight, Egon Luskarten, wrote in a letter in 1949, for me, the loss of my accommodations would have the gravest consequences. In my profession as a composer of serious music, it could impair my creative capacities, thus possibly destroying the very fundaments of my existence. So much of Luskarten's identity had been stripped away, stripped too of his ability to compose, he fears losing the very essentials of his being. Perhaps this explains some of the defensiveness of composers to, to deny that their music, the one intangible part of them that could not be stripped away by Nazi persecution, had gone untouched and unchanged. Oh, pardon me. Even Ernst Krennic admitted, years after the 1950 LA Times article, article by Goldberg, the very composers in question have been inclined to consider the influence of these events, exile, as insignificant. One might explain this as revealing as a defensive attitude on their part, a kind of psychological mechanism that comes into play to protect the self-confidence of the emigre. He seeks shelter, it would seem, in convincing himself that the shock of uprooting did not encroach on his innermost, innermost substance. It is therefore perhaps all the more remarkable that these exiled composers continued to create art so prolifically after emigration. Each piece you will hear this evening was composed after each composer's respective emigration, except for Wilhelm Gross, who died in 1939, only a few months after his arrival in New York. These composers raised families, had pet dogs, taught music, engaged in their new communities, and rather important for us this evening, created art. While it cannot be denied that they faced difficulties many of us can never imagine, the music this evening is a testament to their creative spirit and the human desire to endure.
just thank everybody for coming out here this evening and joining us for this wonderful evening. Um, and we hope that everyone found something new. I know that each one of us sort of found something new and really exciting uh, happening in these works. The last work you'll hear this evening is the Sixth String Quartet from Egon Velis. And this composer had a incredibly varied life. He began his musical journey um, with Baroque opera. He became one of Schoenberg's most uh, successful students, even before Berg and Weber. Uh, he got contracted as a composer. And so in this quartet, you're going to just hear um, a full musical life that was lived. Uh, plenty of characters and great um, tones and moods are present in this work. So please enjoy Velas' uh, Sixth Tune Quartet. Thank you. 